Hello, welcome calculus students. We are going to be going through lesson 4-2 today, but we will begin by checking yesterday's homework. Here are the answers to your homework. Now, Mr. Bastimer or the sub will pause per slide. So, for example, here is questions 12 and 14, and he will pause while you check your work. He'll give you probably like a minute per slide, depending on how long each slide looks and how intense it looks. And if you have any questions, kind of write them down and we can discuss them tomorrow. Or if any students want to step up and answer those questions, feel free. So pause on slide one. Now. And now here we go to slide two. And pause on slide two. And then you can start it up in a second. And here's slide three, question 18 and 31. Pause here. And number 33. 35 and 37. Number 39. 41 and 43. 45, 47, 49. And now we're going to begin our new lesson. Our new lesson is lesson 14, two, I'm sorry, 4-2. This is the mean value theorem for derivatives. As you're writing down the title for today's lesson, this is an extremely important section. Please follow along. I'll do my best to explain it clearly. And we will spend a few days on it. This is one of the number one questions asked on the AP exam. Um, if I had to rate this on a 1 through 10, this would definitely be a 10. So here we go, mean value theorem. And by the way, the word mean here does not really mean an angry value theorem. Mean meaning average. So average value, think of that average, average, average. And here we go. This is an important lesson, so I'm watching you. Please focus. All right, mean value theorem for derivatives. Let's start here at the beginning. The um, Probably right underneath your title, I would definitely write this down. This is the mean value theorem formula. Um, so f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. That's basically it. I'm going to try and go slow enough for you if I am going a little bit too fast. Uh, Mr. Bassmer or the sub would be happy to just pause for a moment for everybody to catch up, but I'll do my best to try and go as slow or as fast as I would go normally in class. Now, mean value theorem or average value basically says one thing. This side of the equal sign, the right side, this you should recognize. Ask yourself, what is this? Where have I seen this? Oh my God, what's happening here? The answer to that is this is slope y minus y over x minus x. Slope. Slope we normally talk about as average speed of an object. This, think about that, what is that? That's the derivative and what does a derivative mean in a real life situation? It means instantaneous speed at a point. So what this is saying that the average speed over an interval is got to be equal to an instantaneous speed at some point between A and B. Now that's kind of the details up here. C's got to be between A and B. So we're going to go through this visually and then we're going to talk about a real world example. The only conditions you have to have on this, there are two conditions. Feel free to write them down. The function must be continuous and you must be able to take a derivative. One more time, differentiable means you can take a derivative of it. The mean value theorem only applies over closed interval. If the endpoints are open, it doesn't really work. And this is what I tried to summarize for you. The mean value theorem says that at some point in the closed interval, the actual slope equals the average, or the actual speed equals the uh, average speed, or a better way of saying that, the instantaneous speed equals the average speed. So there you go, moving on. Here's a visual of what's happening. I'm going to do my best to kind of put the points on here and plot them, and then you guys can follow along. This is points A and B. Okay, so here's a little A. 
Here's a little b. This is your interval. And if you look at your interval from the last slide, your interval was from a to b. So I guess this might be a, and this might be b. Now, somewhere along this curve, in here somewhere, there is going to be an instantaneous rate of change, which equals the average rate of change. Now, I'm going to guess it's definitely not here, because the slope of the tangent line would be like that. No, not that. Hmm. I'm going to guess maybe like right here. If I were to draw a line right there, there, I would say that that average rate of change equals the instantaneous rate of change, which is also the derivative. So let's look at this now digitally. Slope of a chord. Chord is also another way of saying kind of like a secant line. So this secant line here, or this chord, you take the slope by doing y value minus y value over x value minus x value. You get a number. What's the slope of this, this line? I don't know, like one-ish. When you look at the derivative, which I put that point on the other graph, which was kind of like right here, that's the instantaneous rate of change, which is f prime of c. That is equal to this because the slopes are the same. The slope of this is just our good old slope formula. The slope of this is our derivative, which means slope of tangent. Now that's a geometric version of that. That's the visual of what is happening. Here's a couple um, obvious definitions, these I would get down, so I'll read them to you so hopefully I don't go too fast. This is obvious because I've already told you probably 20 times. A function is increasing over an interval if the derivative is always positive. Think about that for a moment. A function is increasing, there's a function that's always increasing any slope you put on here. Oh, that's a bad slope. That slope right there. That slope right there. That slope right there. They're always positive. So no matter what happens here, when the function is increasing, the slope is, the derivative is always positive. If you have a decreasing function, here's a decreasing function. Think about that in terms of slope. The slope is always negative. Okay, so get those two down. The slide's coming down in a moment. And moving on. Once again, if you didn't have enough time, Mr. Basmer can either pause it or you can come back later and visit this later in the video. These two functions have the same slope at any value of x. This is just kind of an interesting fact. If you take this point right here, and here is its same x value, because if I drop that down, kind of this is approximately the same x value. These slopes of the tangent line, let's draw that with a line, shall we? Make it look better. These slopes of the tangent lines are both the same. Sometimes these are called parallel curves because their slope of the tangent line is always the same. Uh, not quite as important. I don't know if you need to get that down, but that's just kind of a ni nice little fact that we may be talking about later. Um, that happens for any value of c, and if you notice, the two functions have the same slope at any value of x or c, and the functions, al functions always um, with the same derivative. They always differ by a constant. Look at these little green bars. They happen to be the same length no matter where you look, but you must look vertically due to the fact that this is the x value, and this is the x value. You're not going to go on a slant because those x values change. Okay, you have to look vertically because the x values are the same thing. Um, you know, is important. This is not as crucially important as the mean value theorem, but just kind of some good facts to know that we will be discussing. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do example one here. I'm going to analytically, and I'll give you a moment to write this down. I'm going to analytically find a few things. Analytically means by hand, not really using my calculator and a graph. Um, some stuff from this function, g of x equals x squared minus x minus 12. So, whoops, I'm going to start by finding the local extrema. Local extrema means biggest and smallest values, kind of like what we talked about yesterday. I know this is a parabola, 
But let's just say it was cubic and not parabola, and it might do something like this. It doesn't because we know it's a parabola opening up because the A is positive. But let's say it did. Extrema are right here and right here. These are local, not global, because it goes up forever, meaning globally it doesn't have a maximum or a minimum, but it has little local maxes and mins here. What do we know about this? We know that the derivative must equal zero here. So to find local extrema, we are going to find the derivative. That would be part A. Do it with me. Derivative, notice how I'm labeling. G prime of x equals 2x minus 1. This is the derivative, which means slope of the tangent line. Extrema has slopes of the tangent lines at 0. So I'm going to replace g prime of x with 0 because g prime of x means the slope of the tangent line. Therefore, I solve. x equals 1 half is the location of the local extrema. Okay, So thinking about a graph here, here's my graph. Here's negative 1. Here's negative half. Somewhere in here is going to be the minimum or maximum of this parabola. Back in algebra, you did one of these things. Negative b over 2a. Then you plugged in the value of b, which is negative 1, negative, negative 1, over 2 times a, a is 1. You got 1 half. I got 1 half here again, but this is done through derivatives as opposed to memorizing the formula negative b over 2a. Now this is better because if it works for not only quadratics, it works for cubics and e's and logarithms and anything else you want. The next question is find the intervals on which the function is increasing. Now let me go back a few slides here. Increasing, increasing. Whoops. A function is increasing over an interval if the derivative is positive. So let's go back and say, hmm, here's the derivative. I wonder where it's positive. Now if I were to graph this, um, this is where it's zero. How did I know that? Because it's zero. So I bet to one side is positive, to the other side is negative. Let's verify that. I'm going to verify that through something called kind of like a little, a little um, sign chart. I'm going to put my x's on the bottom, and I'm going to put my g prime of x's signs on the top. This is a visual which helps me organize my thinking. I'm going to put one half here. That means these numbers are 1, 2, 3, 3.5, 3.2, etc. These numbers are 0, negative 1, negative 1.8, all that stuff. So that's just a number line organized. Now above this, I'm going to put the sign of the derivative. So the sign of the derivative, whoops, right here is 0. How did I know that? By my answer to this, the derivative is 0. I wonder what happens over here. Is it positive or is it negative? Well, let's pick a number. I don't like half because it's a fraction. I don't like like uh, 0.8 because it's a decimal or a fraction, four-fifths. I prefer to have like one or two. So let's pick one. So when I go here, I substitute one in my derivative function. So let's actually change color so you can see my one. Two times one is two. 2 minus 1. Let me do that over here. 2 times 1 minus 1 equals 2 minus 1, which is 1. Is 1 a positive number or is 1 a negative number? 1 is a positive number. Therefore, I know that everything over here is going to be positive. Well, how did I know that it doesn't become negative again? Because I only received one answer for a 0. It can't cross the axis again. If this is my function, f, uh, let's use g g prime, I know that it, at 1 half it hits 0. And that I know to the right of half it's positive. I wonder what's happening to the left. My theory is it's negative, but it could actually be positive too, so I'm going to check. I'm going to check not a 1, I'm going to check a 0. Why did he pick 0? I love 0, and it's smaller than half. So 2 times 0 minus 1 equals uh, 0 minus negative 1. Therefore, everything over here is negative. 
So it's got to go like that. Hey, by the way, that's the line uh, 2x minus 1. Did I do that correctly? So let's just keep going here so we get this through. On at what intervals is the function increasing? So now I'm going to answer that right here in black. This is part B. Increasing. I'll abbreviate that. It's increasing from one half, comma, infinity. I'm going to put a parenthesis on there because I'm not going to include the endpoint. Why is it increasing? Because all of these guys are positive. Positive derivatives mean increasing. C. On which interval is it decreasing? D-E-C-R. Negative infinity, comma, one half. I'm going to put parentheses around them. We'll talk about that fully. Why is it a bracket, not a parentheses? We'll put parentheses on them now, but it, it could actually go either way. you got to have parentheses on the infinities, though. Okay, here you go. Ha have any questions for me? Sorry, you're going to have to ask me later. Example number six. Find the function f of x whose derivative is sine x and passes through 0, 2. Okay, this is kind of an interesting problem. The let's write this kind of down now. The function whose derivative is sine x. So I'm going to put, hmm, the derivative of what is sine x? Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine x. So what's the derivative of negative cosine? It's positive sine x. So I hope you can kind of think backwards on derivatives. That's what you're doing here. You're trying to think backwards. You're trying to come up with this answer. Hmm, what do I take the derivative of and I get a positive sine x? So you think of maybe something you know and you kind of play around with it until you get the answer. So f of x could be negative cosine x. However, it could also be negative cosine x minus 3. That could be y or f of x, it could be, because what's the derivative of negative cosine x? The derivative of co is a negative, so it would be a negative negative sine x, which is sine x, which is what I'm trying to get. Um, but what's the derivative of 3? The derivative of 3 is 0. Okay, that's interesting. So it could actually be also negative cosine x. Hmm, what else? Oh, it could be plus 1. It could be minus 5. It could be plus 2.8. It could even be plus pi. Because the derivative of pi, pi is a number of 0. It doesn't really matter what these constants are, but we notice that all of these answers differ by a constant c. So this is how we write it. We write it like this. f of x must be this. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So now I know that it has to pass through 0, 2. There's a second part on here. This part is called our initial condition. So x is 0, plug in 0 for x. 2 is y, or f of x, plug in 0 there. Solve. Unit circle work, what's the cosine of 0? The cosine of 0 is 1. Do I have work on the next slide? I do. 1. So it's negative 1. Bring over the 1. You get 3. So it happened to be this magic function negative cosine x plus 3. That's the only function that has a derivative of this and goes through this point. You use the initial condition as x, y, plug it in. Once you get your theory of what this is, you just don't know that mystery c. And you use the point to find that c. Um, this going backwards is called an antiderivative. Okay, now I'm not going to have you write this down because I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because you're going to have to do this um, Later, the process of finding the original function from the derivative is so important, it has a name, it's called the antiderivative. Oh my god, the backwards derivative is the antiderivative. A function, capital F of x, is an antiderivative. The, our book uses this, some math books do, some don't. If you use a capital F of x, it just means it's the undoing of the derivative of little f of x. So if you take the derivative of this, it equals little f of x for all x in the domain. This is called anti-differentiation. You're going to hear much more about this because this is just a little quick smattering of an introduction. Later, we'll talk more about it. 
Now, let's how, figure out how we're going to do a problem. This is what's going to be on some of your homework. Find the velocity and position equations for a downward acceleration of 9.8 meters per second. Notice how this is a, is a constant, 9.8. It's not 9.8 times x. It doesn't vary. Its acceleration is constant, kind of due to gravity. And its initial velocity is 1 meter per second downward. We're going to let down be positive in this case. So if you have this little rock here and it falls off a cliff, hits the ground. We're going to call this the positive direction, positive meaning downward. Normally we don't do that. If we didn't, then we'd have a negative 9.8 there. Don't worry about this. Acceleration is a derivative of velocity. So velocity must be the antiderivative of acceleration. So let's go through this and kind of figure it out. Hmm, let's see if this is on the next slide. Oh, it kind of is. Here we go. Now, I wonder what you would take the derivative of and get an answer of 9.8. Hmm. Oh, look at that. It's 9.8t. Because what's the derivative of 9.8t? The number in front. So you go backwards on a derivative. You just slap a variable on it. In this case, t for time. Don't forget, though, this could be plus 4. That's where you use your 1 meter per second. Your 1 meter per second is your velocity. That's your answer to v. What's your answer to t? Initial velocity. I wonder what the time is initially. Oh, look at that. It's 0. Solve. 0 times 9.8 is 0, so c equals 1. This is my new velocity equation. Since velocity is derivative of position, position must be the antiderivative of velocity. They kind of go backwards. Okay, that's pretty easy, pretty simple. Now, what's the, hmm, what is this normally called in calculus? Position. All right, we got a velocity here, function. How do I get position? Well, the one's easy. The derivative of something is 1. I wonder what that is. Well, that's just 1x or 1t. This one's a little harder. How do you do the derivative of something that already has a t? Well, remember when you do this, let's kind of go over here and do this. Um, the derivative of 2x to the third, derivative now, is 6x squared. What did I do? I lowered the exponent and multiplied these two. So how do I go backwards? Well, the exponent is 1, so how do I go backwards? Oh my god, its exponent's got to be 2! Dun, dun, dun. And instead of doing the multiplication of these and getting 6, I do the division of 2. Why 2? Because that was my exponent prior. So 2 divided by 9.8. Instead of the multiplication, you divide. Okay, and I'll go all through all this again, but this is just kind of an introduction. Um, now you need to use an initial condition. Um, we're going to call uh, the initial position 0. So 0 is t, and your position of this rock or whatever it is is 0. So let's just say it starts from rest or a cliff. And if you're on a cliff here, here's my cliff, here's the rock falling off a cliff. Eee! And its position, I'm going to call this 0, and the ground is going to be the ground, or whatever, it depends. Um, Plug in 0 for this, plug in 0 for this. In this case, I'm going to get c is 0. Now, sometimes it will tell you the initial position or the initial velocity. You use this to find your c. Why do you have a c? Well, I've been trying to get to that because whenever you go backwards, the derivative of any constant is 0. So you need to know what that c is. So here are your three answers. Acceleration is a constant. Velocity is a linear model. And then position is a quadratic, and you should that should make sense. When you go backwards, you kind of do the same things. That's it for today. I realize this may be a little confusing for you. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 problems for you to try. So give it a try for these um, 13 for tomorrow. Do your best. All I'm asking is that you do your best. And then I'll be, well, I guess it's going to be Monday. And I'll be back on Monday to, do, to give you a hand if you have any questions. I hope you understand. Thank you very much. Have a good day.